Our next speaker is Professor Hawkins Hood from the University of Sydney, and he's going to talk on neck, pin neck pinchings of mingle vector flow and Hitch flow. So, Professor Hood. Thank you. Okay. Uh, th thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank the organizers for the kind of invitation for me to speak here. So, so I will uh, just begin my talk. So, so we will talk about two flows that are really uh, quite important in geometric analysis, uh, namely the main curvature flow and Ricci flow. So let me first give you the setup. Um, so in this talk, we denote by mg a smooth Riemannian manifold, complete without boundary. And the main curvature flow is the following. So, so if you consider an embedding of this manifold in Rm plus 1, then the main curvature flow just deforms the hypersurface in the direction of its main curvature vector. So if you take the, the sphere, and the main curvature vector will point inwards, and then under this flow, it's just going to shrink. That's the simplest example. And then the Ricci flow is something similar, but it's an intrinsic version. Uh, namely, if you take, uh, uh, again, the Riemann, uh, Riemannian manifold, and you consider it's a metric G, you just deform it in the negative direction of the Ricci. And both of these two uh, flows, they are nothing but uh, nonlinear parabolic equations, uh, and, and uh, they're very similar in many aspects. So, so that's why it's, I mean, a lot of people study them along each other, and then I am including them in the same talk. OK? So they're also, yeah, reaction diffusion type. So let me actually uh, first include a very important principle in the mean curvature flow, it's just a geometric way to visualize the, uh, the maximum principle for parabolic equations. It says the following. Suppose you have two disjoint surfaces or hypersurfaces, then if you run them under mean curvature flow, they probably become some shape like this at a later time. Um, but the point is, if they are disjoint initially, then this picture cannot happen. Because if this were to happen, then the inner surface, the blue one, would have a larger velocity compared to the red one. So the, it, this is not possible for, the, for, the, for something with a slow speed or slow velocity to catch up with someone with a, a larger uh, speed. Okay? So that's an intuitive idea. So here's just w what I just said. So this avoidance principle tells us that if you consider Oh, an important thing is there's no such nice avoidance principle for Ricci flow, even though there's, uh, you can still talk about maximum principle for the, the evolution of the curvature. But for mean curvature, it's just, uh, there's this very nice picture to keep in mind. Okay? Now, um, because of the uh, avoidance principle, the comparison principle, if I consider this black hypersurface and I want to evolve it under the mean curvature flow, what you can do is you can always put in two the big spheres, the blue ones, and then you can also put a torus, the, the, the red surface here, around the neck, okay? And the important thing here to keep in mind is I can, I can well, if these are round, well, my, my drawing isn't that good, but then if these are round, they're going to shrink. And you can also arrange the torus to be such a way that it shrinks in a self-similar fashion. So with these three surfaces, they give you a control. In the sense, the blue surface, the blue part in the middle, uh, sorry, the black surface in the middle, that's inside of the red torus, it has to shrink, but cannot touch the red guy. Whereas the black guys here, they cannot touch the blue guys. Yeah? That, then that's going to tell you that the middle part is going to sort of pinch. Yeah? It's going to, you, it's going to, you're going to crush it before the two ends disappear. So that's the, 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 the nice thing about the, the avoidance principle. So it's very, very visual. OK, now if, if I translate this picture to the level of the curvature evolution, then you are looking at the following. So if you look at the mean curvature, then you compute under the mean curvature flow, the evolution is the, this guy. And then just by applying the uh, maximum principle, then, then you know if initially I have a positive uh, mean curvature or mean convex, then this quantity has to blow up in finite time, OK? And similarly, on the Ricci flow, you just compute the scalar curvature. Then again, it, it's the super solution of uh, 
a PDU with a square, a quadratic nonlinearity. So again, just by applying the maximum principle, then, then you know the positive scalar curvature, well, it will be preserved, but it also will become infin uh, infinite or unbounded in finite time. So, so these are just sort of the, when, when you uh, start looking at the geometric quantities more, more precisely, this is what you see. And, and I'll, I'll just include a non-compact example of the sort of a, this behavior is that you, you take a cylinder with a cross section, let's say S2, then it, whether you consider mean curvature flow or Ricci flow, that's going to shrink, and the cylinder is going to collapse onto a line. Okay, it can also do this for S n cross R k. Okay, so now um, I continue and I, I, I do a slight more classification or I look at a bit closer. So. If your mean curvature flow becomes singular at uh, uh, infinite time, then necessarily the second fundamental form has to blow up, or the, the, its norm. Okay. Now you you can also consider the evolution of the the square norm of the second fundamental form, and then, then you realize that there there is a lower bound on fast; it, ha it has to blow up. Okay. So um, this somehow motivates the idea that okay. Uh, we, we just define a finite time singularity in the mean curvature flow, we just call it type one, if the soup blows up at the, on, uh, on the order of uh, one over square root of the time remaining. And if it blows up any other, uh, any faster rate, we just call that type two, okay? This, is, this kind of concept has been, I think, used pretty uh, extensively in nonlinear PDEs. So, so this is the definition for type one and type two singularities in mean curvature flow. You can have a similar definition for the finite time singularities in Ricci flow. You will see the, the only change the, is, is the change of the exponent here. It's because the, the equation looks a bit different. So, so again, now we move to the Ricci flow. Then necessarily this quantity blows up in finite time, but then uh, you know it has to blow up at least this fast. So we just call the, a singularity to be type one if the square, uh, the norm of the Riemann curvature tensor blows up on the order of one over big T minus little t, okay? And the order just means you can bound it by a large constant times this quantity and a smaller constant by this quantity, all right? And, and uh, we call that type two if it's any faster. So, so this is a really precise rate and this is just everything else, okay? All right. Uh, let's say any questions so far. Okay, so now let me, uh, let us consider some very simple examples. So, so I'll just draw three pictures and then and I'll show you the, the details. Just, I have to. So, so the first looks like this and the second extreme is like this. And I'll just draw the, some picture in the middle. So, so what I mean is, Okay, actually, let's go back. So, so if we're in the first case, so, so the cinching refers to, imagine you have a belt, you put the belt on the equator of the sphere and you just tighten your belt. If the, you, you tighten a little bit, then this is what you look like, or, or the su surface look like, looks like. And, and th this is a sort of a, you can think of this as a small deformation to the round sphere, and then you can, well, of course, if you, you just tighten it a little bit, then you can arrange it so that the curvature, well, you don't destroy either mean convex or, uh, or you don't, or the, um, let's say, Ricci convex, uh, Ricci positive, okay? And then under, in this case, then you can, by the, the classical result of either Hamilton for Ricci flow or, or Huiskin for the mean curvature flow, this guy will shrink, well, it will disappear uh, uh, in, a, in a point in finite time, and then if you zoom in, you will see something looks like a, a round sphere, okay? So that's the, this blow up. Now, and, and the, this kind of singularity shows up as a type two rate. Now, on this extreme, what, what, you, what we've seen earlier is that in finite time, something like this happens. And, and, and of course, this, is the, this, this part of the mantle becomes singular and the rest still remain nice. So, so here, if you, Zoom in, you, you would see something looks like a cylinder, okay? But again, wh wh if it's a cylinder, then, then 
the, the, the behavior of the curvature is more or less like the, that of the sphere. So you're still a uh, type one singular, singularity. But in this case, when you blow up, you, you see a neck pinch. Uh, you always see a cylinder, and, and we call that a non-degenerate neck pinch. And, and then, uh, as you change this configuration a little bit, you, you will still see the same behavior. And if you change the configuration here by a little bit, in a sense, you just change the, how much you pinch here, you will still so see something like this. But then, now, now you have two open sets and you have, let's say, the parameter spaces from zero to one, then you should expect, that just by the topology, right, you have two open sets and a closed interval, you, you might expect something critical or something different in the middle, yeah? So, so this is this, uh, the critical case, and in fact, what happens is the following. So under the flow, either Ricci flow or I mean curvature flow, this part will shrink, this part will shrink, but then it will shrink in the sort of funny way that this part develops a cusp, okay? So, and, 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 and probably here also collapses. So, so, so now, when you blow up, there are two possibilities. So here, when you blow up, you, in fact, okay, actually, let me do this one first. So here, um, you still see something like a, a cylinder, so, so the picture here looks more or less like the picture here in, in terms of the singular behavior. You, they, they still, they are modeled uh, after the cylinder, but uh, here, you, you, you might expect something different, and it turns out you can, you can find, you can construct solutions so that you, you blow up the solution here, you see uh, a different uh, solution. Uh, it's called a uh, translating soliton in the main curvature flow case, and it's called a steady Ricci soliton in the Ricci flow case. So basically, something like this is different from this guy, okay? Um, yeah, so this is a sort of a rough picture of what you can already get from, just consider a one parameter family of uh, evolutions, each kind, you have different behaviors here, and then here are just two nicer pictures I draw. Okay, so I'll just continue. So, so now, um, let me let me quickly describe you the sort of a standard uh, blow-up analysis in in geometric uh, flows business. Let's say if we look under Ricci flow. So, so, for example, here, right? So here, you know, the manifold is shrinking down to a uh, point and, 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 and the curvature is blowing up. The maximum curvature is becoming unbounded. So, so you, you can pick a sequence of uh, points and time along, along the evolution so that the, uh, they become unbounded. And, and uh, of course, the, uh, as they become unbounded, you're getting closer to the singular time, right? And you just want to rescale the metric using this quantity here. So you, we rescale the distance by, we, we multiply the distance by 10 and multiply the time by 100. So you, you want to see something small by zooming into it, okay? Or, or by magnifying. And, and if you can also come up with some curvature bounds and uh, volume lower bounds, so this just to avoid collapsing, then, then somehow you, you have then, then you have this compactness result, which then allows you to deduce that you can have a subsequence converging to some limiting model. So for example, here it's a sphere, okay? So, so that's a sort of a standard uh, uh, analysis approach. And uh, I also mentioned, for, for the rest of the talk, I, I actually mentioned something else, which again is used often to study singularities, but then it assumes typically a strong uh, hypothesis and, and in, in our talk, it will be a rotational symmetry. So, and, and the, of course, the, the nice thing is you reduce the system into a single PDE, but then you, you also gain a, a, a gain, okay? So, so what, what you gain is the following. You, you end up proving convergence independent of subsequence, and you, you also have uh, information on how this kind of singular singularity form, the, namely, in particular, the rate of curvature blow up and also the space-time. You can describe 
the, the precisely the a space-time neighborhood how, how, uh, of the singularity. Okay, and, and this has been used to study the type two degenerate neck pain, something, a picture like this, and uh, I'll try to describe you what happens for that, okay? So, so let me just now describe a, a result by Angan and Velasquez, and that's for the mean curvature flow. So this degenerate, degenerate neck pain in neck, a mean curvature flow. So, so what's, the, what's in blue is important information, the, the black ones you can sort of more or less ignore. So, so the important thing is uh, for, for each integer k, you can construct on Sn, dimension three or higher. Um, actually, he, here is, uh, should be two or higher. Yeah, because you can do, uh, it's mean coverage flow. Um, so that's a typo. So you can construct a solution uh, rigorously uh, in such a fashion that the type two singularity blows up at the rate, here is also very precise, it's one minus one over k, okay? And, and uh, moreover, you can, you can study, you can describe uh, the solution, you can sort of decompose it into four regions, and the important thing is what's becoming singular is, well, first of all, there is this tip part, which co co uh, corresponds to high curvature, and the high curvature meaning really high and it's type two, and, and this is modeled by a translating soliton. And whereas near the equator here in, in the middle, it's just modeled by a, a, a cylinder, okay? So that's a type one rate versus type two. And, uh, and here it's just, uh, okay, the, the rates are sort of discrete, and, and keep that in mind because once you go to non-compact manifold, it, you'll see this changes into a sort of continuous, continuous uh, set. Okay, so here is just a picture. So here, imagine you have a sort of a hypersurface obtained by rotating this profile around uh, the x-axis, and then you do a first blow up near the uh, x equal to zero, the equator, you see something close to a cylinder, and then you do a second blow up, you see something that's a translating soliton. Okay, so that's the idea. Now, you can ask uh, if the similar uh, behavior occurs in the Ricci flow, and, and this was actually uh, verified, in a sense, by uh, Angen and Eisenberg and Knopf, and they constructed um, SN three-dimensional higher that, that Ricci flow solutions that, that give you degenerate neck pinch. That is, in this case, you can, uh, again, you can, you can show that the, the s uh, largest curvature blows up at this prescribed rate, and you can then also describe what's happening to, to the singularity models. So, so near the equator here, again, the type one case, you always have these cylinder, but then the, the, the difference in the Ricci flow is here instead of a, yeah, so, so here near the tip, this picture is no longer a cylinder, but it's what's called a Brian soliton. So it's a soliton that sort of, at space infinity, it opens up like a paraboloid. Okay, so whereas here it's a cylinder. But, but um, yeah, and, and the Brian soliton, if you flow it on the Ricci flow, it, it, it doesn't change. Uh, but if you go back to the mean curvature flow case, if you have a translator, if you run a translator on the mean curvature flow, it, at a later time it just looks like it's been translated. It's exactly what the name says. Okay, so, so, so now I, I've sort of given you two results describing this sort of picture rather rigorously for the uh, one for mean curvature flow and one for Ricci flow. And now let me try to just move to the non-compact case. And the first thing I want to mention is uh, there was a result by Hamilton and Daskalopoulos in 2004, I think published that here, on R2. So of course on R R2, if you consider R2 equipped with a metric so that this manifold has a finite area, then you can look at well, you can always write G to be a conformal uh, multiplication of this uh, Euclidean metric, yeah? So the conformal factor is U. And then the Ricci flow case, in this case, become this log fast diffusion. And then you, which is, uh, I think a lot of people have studied in the PD world. And what you can, what they can show is the following, that under, uh, if you run a Ricci flow on such a manifold, then the, the, curvature, the highest curvature would blow up at type two rate, and, and this rate is minus two. Uh, and, and you can also try to describe the, the singular behaviors. So, 
So I guess the, the picture is um, something like this. It's uh, probably not the best picture. Um, It's gonna be strange to draw the picture, so maybe let me not draw it. Yeah. So, no, yeah, because, because the, the thing is, the, the the whole area is gonna disappear in finite time. But but the, the important thing is, if you if you blow up near the tip, in this case they, they choose it to be, uh, well, if you blow up at the highest curvature point, then 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 it's modeled by a cigar soliton, which is a two dimensional. Um, two-dimensional steady soliton, whereas uh, out at space infinity, because of the finite area assumption, you, you sort of, it's a sort of log, class, uh, log, log cusp closing off, okay? So, so that's, the, that's the sort of the, the precise geometry you can uh, describe for, for this particular example. And, and, and then um, I, I, I had a result which says, now let's consider the case in dimension three or higher, uh, still on Rn, and, and now you can actually show there, there are solutions, uh, so again, it's existence, that each such a solution, they develop a uh, de degenerate neck pinch singularity in finite time, and, and uh, this time the type 2 rate can be as large as you wish, just depending on the, this prescribed number lambda. Uh, on the other hand, the, the geometry is more or less the same in the sense Okay, let, uh, let me take the line back. Let me just say the geometry in this case, near the spatial infinity, it's modeled by a shrinking s a cylinder soliton, and, and the highest curvature region is still modeled by a Brian soliton, yeah. And, and here, here just a remark, is somehow if you, if you consider this blow up rates, it, it's basically anything from two or more, okay? So it's a, now here's just a picture. So here's a solution. You, it's, Asymptotic to cylinder, and here you blow up. It's a Brian soliton. Okay, so it's a schematic picture. Now, once you have such a type of a singular behavior in Ricci flow, you might ask whether something like this would happen in the mean curvature flow. I think it's quite natural to ask. And uh, let me now mention, give you a motivational example. This is from the paper by uh, Maria Saez and uh, Oliver Schnurrer. So now let's consider this black surface, okay? It's a, it's a hypersurface, it's a graph over a ball, okay? And it's also asymptotic to cylinder. And under mean curvature flow, what's gonna happen? Well, at a later time, it's gonna become this guy, yeah? It's gonna shrink and it's gonna move. Now, of course, at a later time, it's gonna keep going. So it's gonna sort of keep shrinking and keep moving. Of course, the cylinder here also acts like a barrier for the initial surface. And if you just shrink the cylinder, I, I didn't draw it, uh, just to make the picture a bit clean, but you would imagine there's also a barrier cylinder for this guy, yeah? So, it's like shooting a bullet in a gun barrel. So, so the question is, um, well, what they show is, this surface will remain smooth and asymptotic to a contracting cylinder, but of course the cylinder will become, uh, a collapsing, uh, will collapse to a line in finite time, right? So you might wonder, and, and more, actually, the surface, but uh, we also, okay, we, we also know there's this uh, avoidance principle. So, so somehow this shouldn't touch. So, so in fact, this guy would disappear at the time as the cylinder collapses. So as far as the, the mean curvature flow solution is concerned, the, the solution is smooth until it disappears. Now, uh, the, the, however, you, you, you might ask what happens really in this process of disappearing or moving to infinity, and also what kind of estimates can you get on the solution? Okay, these are still reasonable questions. So, so, so let, me, let me just give you some quick remarks. Of course, we know this evolving graph will remain smooth and disappear in finite time, but also we know that the speed at which it's translating is proportional, well, it's really just given by the mean curvature, all right? And also we know it has to move really fast, or it has to cover a large distance in a small amount of time. So, so this is indicating you, you have some very fast curvature blow up. Yeah, that's, that's happening to the solution, okay? And, and uh, the, the next job is just to 
try to describe precisely how fast. Uh, not all, but we can certainly show there's a family of solutions with this behavior. Okay? So, 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 so it's the, the theorem is the following. So this is a theorem of uh, Jim Eisenberg and myself who published this year. It, it says the following. So if you give me any real number, I call it gamma, uh, gamma strictly larger than one half, then you can construct a solution such that the highest curvature happening on the left tip, which is here, we can think of the base of the graph if you look at it sideways, is this rate. Okay, so the, the, this description is similar to what happened we see before. You prescribe something, you sort of prescribe the curvature rate, and you, you show you can construct such a solution, but of course now, now you know there exists a solution with such singular behavior. And also, uh, near the tip, this, the, the, the singularity model is a translating soliton in the mean curvature flow case. And also near spatial infinity, it's asymptotic to a cylinder at a really precise rate, depending on this gamma, okay? So, so, so th this is what we show. And, uh, and, and the statement, again, is very similar to the previous ones. It's always the rate and the profile, and there we go, okay? So now let me, uh, let's see, in the time remaining, let me try to describe you the ideas behind uh, this construction. Okay, so, so I guess a couple of remarks. So we, we address these questions, uh, but I don't, I don't know if we have up, uh, optimal rates, but we certainly give some estimates. Um, I think these are the first example of the non-compact solution with a type two curvature below up rates. It's kind of interesting. And uh, you, you also notice a very sort of, I guess, interesting phenomenon, curious phenomenon, which is uh, on a compact uh, a manifold, your, your curvature below up rates, they, they, they're somewhat discrete. And in fact, this is because when you, when you try to un understand what solution happens here, you end up linearizing um, at a cylinder, and, and after that, you look at this linear operator, it happens to be this quantum harmonic operator, which then you, you, you studied with respect to some L2 space, and, and that guy has a discrete, discrete spectrum given by the Hermit polynomials. I'll just tell you why, why it's happening. Whereas somehow, on, on the non-compact case, it's kind of funny because whatever that's here, you don't see it anymore. It's somewhat pushed to infinity, so somehow there's no such restriction coming in. But anyway, it's curious. So, and, and the, what, what's, what's happening in the mean curvature flow also mirror the difference in the Ricci flow case. No, not just the ideas. So, so as, I, as we said, Assuming this, uh, the, symmetry, the symmetry assumptions would tell, uh, reduce the question down to a, a single PDE, uh, still quasi-linear. Now we, we will apply this matched asymptotic analysis to first construct approximate solutions. Okay, so this is a sort of a important first step. You, you can also think of it as a sort of a, a sanity check. If, 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 if things are reasonable or if there's any hope, you can do this construction. So once this is done, then we will perturb this guy to construct the barriers for the PDE, okay? So, and, and uh, here the PDE uh, would, is the PDE coming from the mean curvature flow. And then when, once the barriers are constructed, then, then from the comparison principle, we, we know that any solution inside between the barrier will stay between the barrier. And, and then the asymptotic information of the barrier will give us asymptotic information of the solution. That's roughly the idea, okay? And, and, and then, then we're done, yeah. So, yeah, so, so the point is, this step is sort of a formal, and, and the three, four, five, just to make things uh, mathematically uh, rigorous, okay? Let's see, any question? Okay, good. All right, so, so, so the setup. Let me just quickly describe you what happens here. So, so here, um, so, so this will be, uh, oh, sorry, I guess, uh, what, what did I use? Notation here. R, okay. Yeah. So, so we will look at a curve like this. And, and we're going to rotate it to, to construct our, our hi hypersurface. And, and after that, we, we will get, oops, sorry. 
we want a rotationally symmetric, strictly convex, smooth graphs over a ball. Okay, that's what we want. And and um, what we uh, okay, uh, I guess I, I, it's you instead of R. Sorry about that. Yeah, I was correct. You yeah. So so for the U function, we just assume it's strictly concave and also increasing. And uh, there are this point. I call this where u is zero. We call just we call that uh, the tip. Okay. So so the nice thing is the mean curvature flow in this case for this graph just reduces to this uh, PDE. And and let me just remark that if n is one, then this term is gone. Then you you go back to the uh, the curve shortening flow. Okay. And in the curve shortening flow, you also have a translator. It's known as the Grim Reaper. It's you can actually solve it explicitly. Whereas in higher dimensions, the translator you just think of as a sort of analog of the Grim Reaper. Now, once you have this guy, now let's let's actually introduce some rescaled variables. First, I res rescale the time just by introducing tau to be minus log capital T minus little t. So as little t approaches this guy, this goes to infinity. And here I, I rescale the x direction by calling it y, because in somehow I, I want to catch up with this surface that's moving to infinity. So so by this rescaling, I I just move it back. Okay? And and here I just rescale the height here by uh, the parabolic scaling. So so once these are introduced, then this equation become this equation, okay, in these rescaled variables. It, it's this PDE. It looks it's okay, not too bad. Now, now, what do we do with this PDE? Okay, so now uh, we just invert the coordinates because here we, with the convexity allows us to, uh, instead of looking this surface as a graph over x-axis, in, instead we can look at it as a graph over this axis. So just invert. Then the y, as a function of phi and tau, it, it now solves this evolution. Okay, so don't worry too much about the details. And now we just want to do some analysis. Now, first of all, let me just give you a formal solution or approximate solution. So what's the idea? Well, if you're really close to the singular time, then this quantity tau is very large, right? So you might pretend this were, the denominator were very large, so this is small. Let's also not worry about this guy, because somehow, well, let's not worry about it for now. So now let's just look at the blue part. Now the blue part, uh, let's set it to zero, then let's solve it. And it's actually really easy to solve. It's uh, a constant minus phi square to this root, or to this power, okay? And let's just do a couple of checks. So first of all, if you look at uh, this quantity, right, as phi approach this number, which means as phi approach this here, then, then the y tilde does go to infinity. So that just means you do have sort of asymptotic uh, cylindrical cylindricality, which is fine. And then you also want to just go go back and check whether this this quantity we threw away is small when 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 compare uh, when you try to look at this uh, look at this solution. And and you you plug and check, you realize it's this expression. Just look at the red part. So this quantity is this part is big, right? If this quantity is large, then the whole thing is small. So th the point is, this will serve as a reasonable approximation, provided this quantity is large, and this sort of motivates us to define what's called an exterior region, where, where this quantity is large. And then you just go in and say, okay, where, where this is smaller, you, I just call that interior. It's, that's just a name. But then what you do in terms of the analysis, is let's just introduce a new variable called that uh, Z, and z is on this order, and now we end up looking at the solution uh, or, or, the, or the function y in the z variable and tau, okay? And, and uh, the same PD, the third now written in this coordinates looks like this. So, so how do you understand this? Well, you, you can do some ansatz, and you real, then, then this one works. And the important thing is here, this particular ansatz here, the, this uh, function f tilde is satisfied this equation. And again, we can play the same trick. Let's just throw away this guy. You end up dealing with this equation, OK? I mean, even I wrote a dependency on tau, but let's just pretend this one ODE. 
and, and indeed, this is what's going to happen. So, so let's look at the PD for F tilde. It's the same as solving if you just re rewrite F tilde as sort of this, uh, if you pretend it's a um, something only depending on the space. And actually, that's not quite true because Z here also depends on time. Yeah, just be careful. Just just pretend F is this ansatz. Then the P solves this initial value problem, right? So it's not, now it's some sort of ODE in the Z variable. And, and the, the, the important thing is this is very not nice to solve. So in dimension N equal to one, this term is gone. You can solve this explicitly. You end up seeing the uh, Grim Reaper. Whereas in dimension higher, you can understand the asymptotics. Namely, um, when Z is small, uh, close to zero, that's here, it looks like Z square, and when, when you go out, it's, uh, you have this log term. Okay, now what's the use of this uh, not, uh, information is that then you can go back to the uh, X variable, the unscaled variable, then X is more or less this blue quantity. Okay, so let me just continue. So what can we see from here? So, so the X, so x is the this guy, and you can think you should think of x as a function in u. So that's the u-axis, and that's x, right? So the second derivative evaluated at u equal to zero would give you the uh, the mean curvature up to a scaling, right? And that's the mean curvature at the tip. It's this quantity. And so you see, if I pick gamma to be strictly larger than half, this does give you this uh, type two rate, yeah. And and if you integrate, then you you do sort of cover infinite distance in finite time. And the only thing you now have to worry about is you have a sort of approximate solution coming from here and something coming from here. You, you need to make sure they match in the right way, right? It's like you build highways, you, you match, or a railway track. Now you can match. Let me just say you can match. So, and the last thing, I think my time is out. The last thing is now, after you understood this approximate solution, you build the barriers, which I skip, then the barriers will have the information to being asymptotic to cylinder, which we already saw. And, and you, you now have to do a bit more work to understand the tip, and you just understand the difference between your solution and this number a tilde, and uh, you end up studying this PDE, and the claim is, it does converge to the, the profile of a translating soliton on a, unit, a uniform Z interval. And the way, the, the way you prove it is just by looking at its derivative and then integrate. So my time is up. Uh, I stop here. Thank you very much.